Scripture reading this morning, then, is from Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 18 and 33 to 34. That's found on page 99 in your pew Bible, if you wish to follow along. The book of Leviticus is often called the Holiness Code. It is full of instructions uh, on everything from what kind of materials to wear or not to wear together uh, to how to interact with the foreigners that live in your land. It has all kinds of instructions for the newly formed people of God in their promised land. And so this this is a selection of verses from that Holiness Code. Never seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone, but love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. Do not exploit the foreigners who live in your land. They should be treated like everyone else, and you must love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, am your God. And our gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37, and includes the very popular and well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. But it begins with the most important commandment. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with an illustration. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and money, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a Jewish priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt deep pity. Kneeling beside him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with medicine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two pieces of silver and told him to take care of the man. If his bill runs higher than that, he said, I'll pay the difference the next time I am here. Now, Which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. This is the word of the Lord. There are certain times and certain passages as a minister that you sit and think, Well, what am I going to do with that one that they haven't heard before? Christmas, for example, or Easter, or, you know, all those annual festivals and events that come up. And also really familiar stories like this that are part of our cycle of reading, but that you already know. If I randomly, and don't worry, I will never do this. If I randomly met one at you at the door and said, Bob Reek, this morning you're going to preach on the Good Samaritan. You could fumble your way through it. You'd do a great job. Not fumble, but you would get through it because you know more or less what this story is about, right? You know some of the lessons that we're to pull from it. If we look at the story through the lens of the Levite and the temple assistant, you know that you are not supposed to be like them, right? You are not supposed to walk across the road, turn up your nose, look away, and pretend that there isn't anyone suffering. If we were to think mostly about the Samaritan, you know that you're supposed to see that God uses the most unexpected people to do his will, and that the person that they least expected to ask as, act as neighbor did so. You know this story and what it's about. And so this morning, what I want us to look at is two perspectives that 
I at least haven't thought of very often. I'd like us to use the actual lawyer, that expert in the law, as our entry point this morning. Where is he coming from in asking these questions? What is he seeking? What is his motivation? And what does Jesus do? And how does Jesus respond? And what would happen if we put ourselves in the place of the man on the road? And so these are some of the things that we'll think about today. Now, the last few times that we have looked at the Gospel of Luke, the last three Sundays, we've often, almost always, found Jesus in conflict with religious leaders and experts, right? Who are trying to trip him up and make him say something scandalous so that they can justify their desire to get rid of him. And it is tempting to assume that that might be true of the lawyer in our story also. Because it says that he has come to test Jesus. But this expert in the law, the religious law, is not necessarily being adversarial. He isn't necessarily being disrespectful or looking to trip Jesus or pick a fight or start an argument. Because he addresses him with tremendous respect. Teacher, what should I do? If you're trying to trap someone or challenge them, as the Pharisees were with Christ often, you don't start from this respectful tone of, teach me, show me, instruct me what I should do. But Jesus, being a fairly new rabbi on the block, right? He hadn't been teaching for that many years publicly. It is fair that this man who's meeting him for the first time might test him in the sense of, of judging out, weighing out where Jesus fits in the scope of theological teaching. Will Jesus be in line with the law, or does he challenge the law? And so he asks Jesus a question. The most important question he can come up with, what is it that I need to do to inherit eternal life? And in the law of the Jewish faith that this man was part of, there would have been a clear answer to that question. And he is seeing whether or not Jesus will affirm and uphold that answer. We see through Jesus' response that he doesn't mind the question from this man. He actually almost seems to encourage it because knowing this man is an expert, he says, well, what do you think the law says? How do you understand what Moses has taught you about this? And the lawyer gives the expected answer. The predictable answer. He begins by quoting something called the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, which reminds God's people that they are to love the Lord their God with all of their heart and soul and might. And he begins, and then he adds on Leviticus 19, and that he should love his neighbor as his self. So basically, when the man has said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what do you know that the scripture says? How do you understand it? The man says, I need to love God with all I've got, and I need to love people. And Jesus says, right, you got it. So this expert in the law has correctly asked and answered the question. But it's obvious that he's not fully content to think that he's living that adequately. So he asks a follow-up question, who is my neighbor? Right? Now, in the ancient Near Eastern view of a neighbor, it would have been strictly those within your tribe or your group. Right? It wasn't tied particularly to geography, but a Jew in Jerusalem would have believed at that time that their neighbor was not necessarily the Moabite or the Samaritan or the Amorite or the Amalekite living next door to them or down the street or around the block, but their neighbor definitely was the Jew in Ephesus. Right? It was about what group you belonged to that determined your loyalty to one another and your obligations to one another. And so, to this, to this man's way of thinking, he had an idea of who his neighbors were. It was the people like him. But Jesus really flips that upside down in the story. Jesus expands that idea of who the neighbor is. Isn't that kind of creative to barbecue over the fence? Let's just put a gate in. But Jesus expands that. 
Jesus helps him to redefine neighbor by telling a story. And always Jesus is strategic about how he tells stories, right? In the first part of the story, when the man is beaten up and lying on the road and a priest comes along, this Jewish expert in the law, this lawyer, would be thinking, oh, good news, this Jewish man's laying on the road and here comes a priest. He'll help him because they're neighbors, right? And loving God and loving neighbors goes together. And yet in the story, Jesus has the priest cross the road and go on by. And Jesus has a temple assistant, which is like an associate pastor if they had such a structure, right? The senior pastors just walked by, now an associate pastor or the minister and the minister's assistant have just walked by. And they expect, oh, okay, well, maybe the the, the priest was too busy, so this assistant will help. And so Jesus has the assistant cross and walk by. So by the time that the Samaritan, who is the hated outsider, stops and helps the man that is on the road, our lawyer, our first hearer, and, his, and the group with him would be thinking, huh, I didn't see that coming. Because Jesus has flipped this idea of neighbor being like us on its head. He has upheld the current view of the law, which is that to inherit eternal life, you must love God and love your neighbor. But he is challenging how they think of neighbor. Rather than answering simply, and by the end of the story, sorry, Jesus actually poses another question. He says to the, to the lawyer, essentially, it's not about who you think is your neighbor, but who proves to be your neighbor. At the end of the story, he looks at the man and he says, now which of these three, the two Jewish players that you would expect or the Samaritan, acted like a neighbor to this man on the road? Who proved to be this man's neighbor? And Jesus, in this story, then expands the neighborhood well beyond the lawyer's view including not just the command in Leviticus 19 to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor, but also to care for and love those who aren't like you, the foreigner. And so this Jewish lawyer begins to understand that the neighbors that he is to love are not just those that he knows and cares about and recognizes himself in. That this idea of neighbor is not defined by location and group, by but by being human and needing care and concern. And this reflecting on who our neighbor is and how we interact with our neighbor is important in all times of history. It's part of why it is in the eternal word of God. Because neighboring and knowing our neighbor and caring for our neighbor and seeing our neighbor matters immensely. It's an interesting trend as a minister and as a, and as a biblical theological scholar to see the trend in how books and, and themes come and go in Christian thought. When I was training 20 years ago, when I was starting, <laughs> it's slightly more, but we'll round up, round down, slightly more than 20 years ago when I started, the big focus was church growth. Grow, 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 grow. You had to just worry about that. And who cared if you knew people? Just grow, 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 grow. Then it was, know God, grow deeper in your faith, grow deeper in your faith, grow deeper in your faith. These are both very good things. But lately, more and more, the articles and the books and the uh, initiatives that are being undertaken are know your neighbor, love your neighbor, be a neighbor. Neighboring has become a verb. And there is a whole book that you can read and an entire website of resources uh, that will help you with the art of neighboring and having a neighboring campaign within your church. And I was reflecting, when I was reflecting on why that was, it really struck me that I think it's because the individuality and the isolation of our society is continually increasing. Just recently, in sharing with me about a tragic event in their, life, in their family's life, a member of this congregation said to me, people just aren't connected anymore. They just don't know who to reach out to or where to find help. And in our time of unprecedented mobility, when we can go anywhere, and our increasing ability to talk to someone at all times, we are also becoming increasingly isolated. 
can be hard to make lasting connections with those that live just next door to us or across the road. And so we reflect on neighboring because we know that even though we know we are to love our neighbor, it has become more difficult to do so. Often we are very good at loving our global neighbors. We've become quite good at that as churches, in reaching out, or or our farther away neighbors, in going to other places to serve, in sending money and donations to other places, in expressing our love to neighbors globally, forgetting that the neighbors right at home matter too. But as we neighbor, whether globally or at home, we do it because we know it witnesses to God's love and value for all people. How we are as neighbors matters because it reflects to the world, fairly or not, how God is. How they perceive us to be is how they perceive God to be. And so when those priests and temple assistants walked past the man in that moment, the man may have perceived that God did not even care, that not even God cared for him in his situation. As the church, we continually make sure that we are not walking past those that are in need, but are looking for where that need exists at places like Evangel Hall, but also right here at home. This story also reminds me and us that being a neighbor is done in hundreds of small things. The Samaritan in the story of the Good Samaritan makes many changes and they all start out as small ones. He stops. Small decision. He checks if the man is okay. A small decision. He looks after him. He administers first aid or something equivalent, right? A small decision. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him. He leaves him. He provides money. All of these small actions on the way make a big impact. Because of my age, I can't think about neighbors without thinking about Fred Rogers, Presbyterian minister and very popular television star. And the hundreds of small ways that he tackled big issues. The hundreds of small ways that he demonstrated to children and their parents and anyone else he would watch that being a good neighbor doesn't have to look like a radical action but can be small things with great love. The picture I have up is of a very famous scene in one of the episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. That is Officer Clemens on the left and Mr. Rogers on the right. And at a time when segregation of pools was a hot topic of debate in the U.S. and when being touched or in contact with a person of color was scandalous, Mr. Rogers orchestrated a scene. It is a warm day and he is sitting outside in his backyard with his feet in the kiddie pool. And along comes Officer Clemens, and they begin to have a conversation about how hot it is out, how warm. And Mr. Rogers says, well, I'm just cooling my feet in the pool. Come on, Officer Clemens, come and come and cool your feet in the pool with me. And Officer Clemens initially protests and says, oh, well, I couldn't, you know, I don't have a towel. And Fred Rogers says, well, that's okay. You can use mine. And the collective society went, (gasps) oh. But he does. And so Officer Clemens sits with him. They have a lovely chat about whatever they talked about. Uh, And at the end, Mr. Officer Clemens uses his towel and they're done. To children, that's just a lovely opportunity to put your feet in the pool with your friend, right? But on a broader level, it challenged the stereotypes of how people should interact with one another, of who matters, of whether or not there could be contact. Small acts with great love, simple things, can begin to flip how we think of ourselves and our neighbors and our worlds. This is what the gospel looks like. And it is a great reminder. I mean, that's like almost 40 years ago. 
and we're still talking about it, and it is that picture and that video is all over the internet. And people still talk about it. Because when we love God and love our neighbor in practical and small ways, it gets noticed. Leviticus 19, the command in that holiness code for the Jewish people at the time, made it very clear that a love for God and a love for our neighbor is the result of remembering that God himself has cared for us. But this isn't the only place that the story invites us to reflect on how we neighbor, or on who our neighbor is, or on why the lawyer asked the question. This story also invites us to reflect on our own experiences of having neighbors and on our need for neighbors, about experiencing the kindness and care of neighbors and allowing them to care for us. All of us have had moments when it feels like this picture, like the big weight of life is going to crush us. And over my almost four years, it will be four years on Friday since we've been together, In my almost four years here, I have noticed that you have a characteristic much like me, fierce independence and the desire not to need help from other people. We are far better. You're all smiling and laughing, huh? See, because I hit this truth. (laughs) We are very good at being Martha's, of serving other people, of looking for other people's need and meeting it. And that is good for us to do. The Good Samaritan makes that clear. But sometimes we are also the man lying on the road. Broken, discouraged, frustrated, not able to serve in the ways that we once could. And it can be very difficult for us to let others come and neighbor us. To accept that we need to let them do some things for us. To admit that we can't always do things alone. As a church of Martha's and as a minister who's a lot more Martha than anything else, I sat and reflected this week on how there is an invitation here for us to allow others to minister to us too by enabling them the opportunity to love us as their neighbor. We have in our book, in our hymnal, number 635, just off the top of my head, a hymn that says, Brother, sister, let me serve you. And we all go, yes, let me. Let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. And we say, absolutely, we want to be. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Because I know you're like me, we squirm a little bit more there. The hymn goes on to remind us that we are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. As a congregation, one of the most beautiful things that you are committed to is the service of others. And I commend that, and I celebrate that. And when my ministerial friends talk about how difficult, not necessarily in town, but my minister friends talk about how difficult it is to spur their congregations to do something, to care for other people, I think, huh, not my battle. (laughs) Not Knox's problem. (laughs) But because I know you, and because I know me, and because I care about us, I would like to encourage us that not only should we express our love of God and neighbor by caring for and neighboring them, but by allowing them to do for us the same. I think that begins with admitting when we need help or when we can't. And knowing that when we do that, someone will come alongside us, someone will help, someone else will and to free ourselves from guilt in those moments. Because God desires that we enable each one of us to use our gifts. And those gifts will be used outside of this congregation, but they will be used within this congregation too. So as we move into the rest of our service and we reflect on the goodness of God, his love for us and his call for us to love the world, and as we consider the ways that we actively serve our neighbors, let us also reflect on the ways that as good neighbors, we can let others begin to serve us. Not comfortable, but
but gospel. And so it is my prayer that all of us will be able to do that more freely. Amen.